What's up, YouTube? Welcome back to Tidal Gardens. You've probably seen several of the tank reviews that I've done on this channel. On other occasions, you've probably heard me say that there's many ways to be successful in this hobby. Just to drive that point home, let's take a look at three different aquariums, all roughly the same size, all very successful in my opinion, with completely different methodologies. So we're going to be taking a look at Nathan's tank, Will's tank, and Rico's tank. And I'll probably provide links in the description below to see the other videos that I've done on those tanks, as well as uh, perhaps some cards, if I can figure out how to do that. I'm gonna be paying special attention to flow, lighting, and how they maintain water quality because these are all pretty involved topics. If you're able to do those three areas pretty well in this hobby, you're gonna be successful. And so it'll be interesting to see how these three guys approached those three topics differently. Before I get too far into this comparison, I should probably give a rough description of those three tanks. So all three of them are, they're mixed reefs to some degree. I would say that all of them really lean heavily towards SPS, mainly Acropora, but there are other varieties of coral in them. As I mentioned before, all three are roughly the same size. They're in the ballpark of between 220 gallons to 300 gallons in the case of Rico's Reef. All of them also have quite a lot of sump space, so that increases the total volume to somewhere in the neighborhood of 350-ish to 500 gallons. So without further ado, let's jump into the first topic, lighting. In Nathan's tank, he uses 100% LED. And interestingly, he uses my favorite LED ever made, which is the Aqua Illumination Soul Blue. These things probably haven't been made in 10 years at least. They were one of the original fixtures that Aqua Illumination ever made, and I always liked the beefier heat sinks on them. I liked the color that they produced, and the coral seemed to have liked them quite a lot as well. One other LED fixture that Nathan used was this custom LED strip. Now, the company that used to make that strip I don't believe is in the aquarium business at all anymore. But the kind of the interesting component to that lighting setup was that it contained cyan colored LEDs. And that kind of gave an interesting highlight to a lot of his corals. Next up, in Rico's tank, he uses primarily LED as well. And I wish that I remembered the exact brand that he uses, but I can't for the life of me remember. It's it's some brand that I literally had never heard of until he told me. But um, essentially, it's, it's a fixture. I believe it's in roughly the $250 range. In addition to those LEDs, he uses some retrofit T5 bulbs. So it is this combination of LED and fluorescent. However, it's leaning very heavily towards that LED component with just a touch of T5. This is a setup that I like quite a lot because I think that LEDs, for all of their other weaknesses, their amazing strength is that they do a great job of showing off the corals. What they lack in the way of coloring corals up can kind of be mitigated by just adding a little bit of T5. And I always say that even if you don't like the look of T5s, you can just have them running while you're at work or something, you never even have to see them. And when you come home, you can enjoy your tank in whatever color temperature you choose. Lastly, let's take a look at what Will did. In Will's system, he uses primarily T5, so it's kind of the inverse of what Rico is doing. He's got some eight bulb T5 fixtures, two of them. And in addition to those T5 fixtures, he has a single pendant, which I believe is a Kessel to get that shimmer effect it's right in the middle of the tank. Notably absent from any of these guys' aquariums is Metal Halide which if this comparison was done maybe 10, 15 years ago, I would be willing to bet that maybe two of the three would have had metal halide of some sort. Because as much as I hate to say it, if you're looking for just coral coloration and health, metal halide still might be the best form of lighting out there. But there's so many drawbacks in the way of heat, in the way of electricity consumption that just the other two types of lighting have really overtaken it since. My personal lighting preference, it's T5. 
but I think that the later generations of LED are making some big improvements and it may be just a matter of time before LED really takes that big step and becomes a viable full replacement that has the best of all worlds. Even though I have this preference, I would never say that it's impossible to keep coral or to grow coral or even to color up coral under LED currently. I think it's just that sometimes folks are looking for a very specific coloration they find online and in many cases that appearance can only be achieved under something like metal halide and T5. And when you put that particular coral under LED for extended periods of time, oftentimes that coloration changes. And so that's kind of where I'm coming from when I'm talking about LED not quite being there yet. And in some cases, they might even be able to maintain color, but it's not quite the same. It's missing just that last little bit of refinement. All right, let's hop into the next comparison. Let's talk about flow. Unfortunately, I think all three of these guys use basically the same pumps. There's gonna be differences in orientation and whatnot, but I think all of them have a re return from a sump system. And to provide additional flow, they're using max spec gyre pumps. At the greenhouse at Tidal Gardens, we use a variety of pumps. We have some Tunzies, we used to even have some Ecotech pumps, but my personal favorite is the Max Spec Gyre. I think it's a fantastic pump. It comes apart very nicely for maintenance. Its performance is excellent. Um, I like its controllability, even though we, we typically just have the, the pumps running consistently. But yeah, these guys all pretty much have gone the same direction. So unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of compare and contrast there. But I can say that in their tanks, which are, again, more SPS dominant, more SPS heavy, uh, they've got quite a lot more flow than what I have going through my, uh, my frag systems. And in that sense, I would really like to get more flow like their tank, but um, I'm not really able to just because of just how many units I would need. I, I would think I would need something on the order of like 30 something pumps, and we're just not quite there yet. But when it comes to selecting pumps for your system, there's a lot of good options for you. Um, I, we, um, I guess all four of us here, landed on max spec gyres, but there might be five other brands that could give you very similar performance if you wanted it. If I was to give any practical advice, just kind of like a buying guide sort of mentality, I would hedge towards getting larger pumps that you can dial back if they're kind of overpowering things as opposed to potentially buying too weak of a pump and essentially at that point having to replace it entirely because it just doesn't do the job well. So it's, I like controllability. And again, oversize it if you need to, but make sure you get enough flow in the aquarium. It's one of the most important things that tends to get overlooked. I guess I should also address their return pumps from their sump systems. None of them have gone super crazy as far as turnover goes. And I think that's smart because you really don't need excessive turnover, I guess, in the whole system. You obviously want to have enough flow going through the system to make the sumps meaningful in that regard. There's no point in just having a really nice protein skimmer, for example. If you're not really directing enough tank water through it, on a given day. So you essentially have a very, very clean sump and that filtration doesn't necessarily transfer to your show tank. Not a good thing. So size it appropriately, but don't go completely ridiculously overboard when it comes to the return. Okay, speaking of protein skimmers, last comparison, and this is quite a large topic, so it's water quality and how to go about maintaining water quality. I'd like to approach that in three different subtopics. So we can talk about water quality in terms of filtration and nutrient removal. We can talk about it in terms of a water change regimen. And we can talk about it in terms of replacing major and minor elements. All right, let's hop in and talk about nutrient removal. In Nathan's system, Nathan uses a combination of a refugium with some macroalgae. He uses a, a protein skimmer, probably a little bit oversized for his system. And then at different times, 
he uses carbon GFO and bio pellets. Now I say at different times is because sometimes it's a little bit possible to overdo it with bio pellets and sometimes you can see that in the corals they look a little bit pale they look a little kind of singed and so depending on the time period the bio pellets may or may not be there next up in rico system it's quite a bit more simple and streamlined he uses a very large skimmer uh, this particular reef octopus skimmer is one that I have plugged into a 1,000 gallon system. So almost double the size, I would say, uh, compared to Rico system that he's got this on currently. And it does a great job skimming my 1,000 gallons. So it's probably doing every bit as good a job on, on this particular system, which is about 500 gallons, give or take. He also uses a refugium filled with chato and uh, Every few months, I guess, he would go and, and harvest that and you would remove all sorts of heavy metals and things like that that would get bound up in the macroalgae. On the wall there, he's got canisters where he used to run carbon and GFO, but they really haven't been used in a very long time. His tank simply hasn't needed it. So you kind of have like the framework for two very similar systems, but I think that you can see how in Rico's tank that has kind of established, um, I guess, a good balance of things, a lot of that extra technology just hasn't been necessary. And that's a very nice luxury to have. It's always easy to add more pieces of, of equipment, hoping that you'll get better results. But it's really nice to be able to also back off of a couple technologies here and there and know that you can still maintain those same results. Nutrient removal in Will's tank is probably a bit more of an outlier in this comparison of the three systems. He is running aquaforest, so it is heavily dependent on bacterial filtration that's going to essentially break down nitrogen and phosphate at the bacterial level first. And that bacteria, that the, all the probiotic stuff that's going on in aquaforest, will then get removed by the protein skimmer. So in his particular sump, he's got a decent sized protein skimmer. I believe that is a, a Vertex um, Omega 250. And he's also using some BioBlock Media, which is supposed to have both aerobic and anaerobic bacteria at work in there. And just all the different chemistry that kind of goes into aquaforest kind of promotes this um, this bacterial probiotic uh, filtration method in addition to all that he uses the carbon the it's a gfo like product that aquaforest has uh, called phosphate minus and then he also runs a little bit of zeolite and all three of those are done in a reactor so Will's system I would describe as a very ultra low nutrient system that's pretty much tailor made only for small polyp stony corals. I would say that if he was to add more LPS and polyps and soft corals into this type of aquarium, they might struggle quite a lot just because there's essentially nothing in the water for them. The topic of nutrient removal also kind of overlaps this next topic of water changes and what techniques and methodologies that kind of go along with that. So obviously one way to reduce nutrient in your tank is to just take out large portions of water along with that nutrient and then replace it with freshly made water. And over the course of different iterations of that, you get more diluted water and essentially cleaner water. So starting with Nathan's tank, he has perhaps the most elaborate system when it comes to water changes. He has a continuous water change going, and what's involved in that is two dosing pumps. One that is removing water at a constant rate from the aquarium, and he has another dosing pump that's adding freshly made water in the same proportion. So this continuous water change system removes and replaces every day roughly seven gallons of water which doesn't seem like a lot initially, but you can imagine how that would add up pretty quickly over the course of, let's say, a month. 
for you math whizzes out there that have figured it out already, that's roughly 200 gallons, give or take. Or the entire water volume of the aquarium itself. Having talked to Nathan recently, however, he's considering adding in a traditional water change where you would just, in a big bulk amount, remove, let's say, 20-30% and refill it. And he was noticing a couple of little troublesome things with certain corals and perhaps a larger water change would help. So he's considering that. In contrast, Rico does not do water changes. So this incredible looking reef, full of SPS, chock full of SPS, some of the most sensitive corals you can really find, has zero water changes. And if you've spent any time on my channel, you'll know that I'm the biggest proponent of water change. But this serves as a great example of how different people can approach this hobby differently. And if done extremely well at a high level, you can have great success. Here is where I have to throw in the caution for a lot of the beginning hobbyists. Given the choice between two systems, one that involves regular water changes plus controlled continuous water change to achieve a certain result, or doing none of that and achieving the same type of result, clearly one of these two is gonna look a lot more attractive than the other. I mean, most people would say, no, I'm not gonna do any water changes if I can get these results. The problem is you kind of have to take the system as a whole. This might not work for you because you simply don't have Rico's tank. I mean, he has a lot of other things that he's doing very, very, very well. And this might not translate to a 25 gallon tank that you have in your dorm, for example. Okay, I guess the one way I can illustrate this is with a little story of me as a kid. This is how dumb I was as, as a child. When I was a little kid, there was this television commercial that would play. It's for like gum, like some kind of spearmint gum. And at the end, this guy that's a hang glider pops in like a little thing of gum, has a fresh look on his face, and he goes and he jumps off of a cliff and, and is hang gliding away. My little kid brain thought that if I chewed that same gum, I could fly. And my little kid brain completely ignored the entire hang glider part of this. So again, when, when we're looking at some of these aquariums, you can look at the individual components, but you do have to, again, don't miss the hang glider. All right, and in terms of water changes, looking at Will's system here, he does a traditional water change. Drain X percentage out of the tank, replace it with newly made salt water. What's nice about his system is that he already has large containers of both fresh water and salt water going. So he can do very, very large water changes at the blink of an eye. That's one thing that I personally don't have going on at the greenhouse. And one that I would absolutely love to have is just pre-made salt water from the day before so that you can get rid of all the weird irregularities with temperature. You can avoid any issues with salt that's not quite mixed up perfectly. Ideally, you would have salt that was mixed well ahead of time. So if you're planning out your systems, think about having some room to have some storage containers of significant volume. Okay, final topic when it comes to water quality. SPS tanks consume a whole bunch in the way of calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, plenty of trace elements as well, and especially when you're talking about the density of corals that you see in both Rico's tank and in Nathan's tank. Lesser degree in Will's tank only because his tank is fairly new if you've uh, been following his tank build. I mean, his tank is less than a year old. And I fully expect in the next year for it to look a lot more similar to the other two. Looking first at Nathan's tank, he uses a two-part dosing system. So similar to doing a, a continuous water change, these use dosing pumps, and they basically inject a very small amount of a calcium supplement, an alkalinity supplement, and you can kind of tune it depending on your testing levels. So as your corals get bigger and bigger and bigger, they're going to consume more calcium and alkalinity. And 
you kind of have to match your dosing with the growth of your corals. Also, the amount of water changes that he's doing goes a long way towards replenishing trace elements. In a RICO system, he maintains calcium and alkalinity levels through the use of a calcium reactor. Calcium reactors are very nice in the way that they maintain calcium alkalinity very gently and very consistently. The way that they work is that they recirculate water in a, re in a reaction chamber and by bubbling in carbon dioxide, you lower the pH of that reaction chamber and you dissolve that media, which gets dripped back into the tank slowly. And the end result is rock solid chemistry. On some occasions, he also drips Kalkwasser, which is a calcium hydroxide solution. It's different than two part, it's different than a calcium reactor, but it is yet a third way that can be used to help raise calcium and alkalinity. I promise to do a more in-depth video on Kalkwasser on its own, but the reason why I'm just glancing over it here is because Rico doesn't do it very often. I think he said that at most once a month. The other thing that Rico does to reintroduce a lot of the trace elements and even some of the major elements that might be depleted through coral growth that the calcium reactor doesn't necessarily pick up is feeding. He feeds very heavily and he feeds a wide variety of foods, a lot of them not just for the fish, but, uh, but actually coral specific. And so there's the different types of amino acids and things like that that you can put into the water that will help uh, make up a new, any kind of nutritional gap that might be from the corals not getting everything they need directly from the water. And lastly, once again, it's Will's tank. And Aquaforest kind of has its own methodology when it comes to replenishing trace elements, major elements, and whatnot. They use this component 1, 2, 3, which is the calcium, alkalinity, and I believe magnesium. But with all of those component 1, 2, 3s, there are also specific trace elements along with those. And so he's using a dosing system very, very similar to what Nathan's doing. In addition, a lot of the chemicals that are used in the aquaforest system are to feed corals, particularly SPS. So there's this combination of adding um, major minor elements through, that, through the dosing pumps and also through the feeding itself. And probiotic systems that are used for ultra low nutrient, um, a lot of the bacteria that's in the water column and proliferating also get consumed by the coral. So the best way that I could describe it, it's a filtration method and also a method of feeding the corals at the same time. All right guys, that pretty much does it for this perhaps oversimplified comparison of three pretty different tanks. I just wanted to kind of use this as an illustration to show that different strokes for different folks, there are different ways to be successful at reef keeping. And I'm curious, in the comments below, let me know which of these kind of appeals to you or which types of systems you ended up going with. If you have questions about anything that we've covered, by all means, toss it in the comment box below. Hopefully I can get to answering it. If not, perhaps somebody else in the community will have a better answer for you than I do. Hopefully you guys found the video helpful and enjoyable. And if you liked it, please, by all means, give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you guys next time. Happy reefing.